Okay, hi everybody. Um, let's start by, uh, or let's continue um, looking at the influence of ideas on modern painting. Okay, uh, so back to Marcel Duchamp. Um, we mentioned data in an earlier presentation. Uh, I just wanted to explore Marcel Duchamp's relationship to, to the data artists. Uh, now, Marcel Duchamp is considered a pioneer of the data art movement. Data began as an anti-war movement in Zurich, and Hans Arp said that he and his fellow artists were revolted by the butchery of World War I. And so we sang, painted, made collages, and wrote poems with all our might. Now, everything about their culture was called into question. They, uh, they rejected reason and logic, and they embraced nonsense, irrationality, and intuition. They set out to destroy traditional values in art and to create a new art to replace the old. Now, Duchamp was not directly associated with the European data group, but his questioning of the fundamentals of Western art had a profound influence on them. Uh, Duchamp became involved with a small group of data artists in New York, recognizing the similarities between their ideas and the ideas that he had developed in his ready-mades and his large glass. The New York dataists were particularly upset by the rejection of Duchamp's fountain, we talked about this last time, by the Society of Independent Artists in 1917. Oh, this is, uh, this is Marcel Duchamp. This is called LHOOQ. Uh, from 1919. All this is, is a postcard of the most famous painting in the world, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Mona Lisa. And what Duchamp did was drew in a little mustache and beard, and then he called it L-H-O-O-Q, um, which, uh, which is, uh, it stands for something. You guys can look it up. <laughs> Now, I want to introduce you to uh, Black Mountain College. Black Mountain College was founded in 1933, Asheville, North Carolina. It's about 684 miles from New York City, again, the center of the art world at this time. Experimental in nature, Black Mountain's interdisciplinary program prioritized art making as a necessary component of any education. Now, the founding of the college coincided with the rise of Adolf Hitler and the beginning of the persecution of artists and intellectuals in Europe. So some of these refugees found their way to Black Mountain. This is Joseph Albers teaching a color theory class at Black Mountain College. He's one of these Im recent immigrants from, uh, from uh, Germany. He was German. And he had escaped. He fled Germany and came to uh, New York, and he, uh, he, uh, he was at Black Mountain for years. Um, so some of these refugees found their way to Black Mountain either as teachers or as students. And many of the legendary school's faculty would go on to become some of the most influential figures in the arts, including the poet Charles Olson, uh, Willem de Kooning, Buckminster Fuller, composer John Cage, and choreographer Merce Cunningham. Now, Robert Rauschenberg enrolled as a student at Black Mountain in 1948. He was 23 years old. He became known for collecting piles of discarded materials while he was on garbage duty. It was, it was the way the school was run. Uh, students were expected to do chores. It was run communally, like a, like a, like a, a, a community school. Okay? Uh, so he would collect garbage and bring it, instead of you know, disposing of it, he would, he would keep it, turning an unpleasant task into an exciting expedition of discovery and this kind of salvaged treasure would be used to create his famous combines a couple of years later when he went back to New York City. Um, he completed his courses in 1949, but he would return in 1951 for the summer session and then again in 1952 for the summer session. Okay, now while he was studying at Black Mountain College, Rauschenberg created a series of all white paintings. They're just called the white paintings and they're dated to 1951. The pristine surfaces of these all-white paintings reflected the changes in the light and shadows of their environments, okay? Registering ambient events, like the movement of viewers. Right? As, as people would move around in, in, the, in the gallery, say, uh, their shadows would be cast on the, uh, on, on the paintings. 
Um, Rauschenberg said that the paintings were never complete. They were always in the process of becoming something other than what they were before, always changing depending on their environment. And he made them in a variety of formations. Uh, he made one, uh, I think there were seven of them, um, a single panel, a double panel, a three panel one, a four panel one. You, you, you get the idea. Now, naturally, these paintings were considered shocking uh, when they were first exhibited outside of the experimental and progressive environment of Black Mountain College, although I'm sure even at the college, people were scratching their heads wondering what was he up to. Um, but they've gradually become recognized as important precursors to minimalism and conceptualism, which we're going to talk about a little later. Uh, one of the most radical aspects of the series was that Rauschenberg considered them remakeable. So like the ready-mades, Marcel Duchamp, Rauschenberg thought of them primarily as an idea. He allowed them in later years, in fact, to be repainted without him being physically involved at all in their fabrication. <clears throat> he said that they were like clocks, suggesting that if a viewer was sensitive enough to the subtle changes on their surfaces... They could tell the time of day or what the weather was like outside from the changes on the surfaces of the canvas. Okay, just the subtle, subtle uh, influence of the environment. As contemplative objects, they serve the same purpose as any other painting. Now, the white paintings certainly represent Rauschenberg's search for something new in painting. He was rejecting the high art, spiritual tone, and the seriousness of the abstract expressionists and he was presenting paintings that were nothing more than tools for simply communicating ideas. What else could they be? They were just painted flat white. Um, <laughs> there's nothing else you can do with these paintings except think about them. One could say that he's also displaying his sense of humor with these works, but it would be a mistake to dismiss them as a joke. The, uh, the philosophical questions raised by the white paintings about the nature of art and about the role of the artist, they continue to resonate throughout the art world. And this is John Cage. Um, the composer John Cage, he, uh, he was teaching at Black Mountain in 1952 uh, during the summer when Rauschenberg was there. And Rauschenberg's white paintings would inspire John Cage's famous silent composition, Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, it was called. And it was comprised of nothing but four minutes and 33 seconds of silence and the ambient sounds of the environment heard by the listeners. So imagine being in the concert hall. Uh, in the first performance, the pianist David Tudor sat silently in front of the piano with a stopwatch. The music, then, is coming not from the piano, if he's not playing any music, if it's just silence. The music comes from the ambient noise of the concert auditorium. So imagine you're sitting there in the concert hall, nothing is happening, you're hearing a cough, you're, uh, you're hearing shuffling feet or people moving around in their seats, you're hearing birds tweeting outside. John Cage said that this, this, uh, these incidental sounds or the environmental sounds or the ambient sounds were the music. His point is, is, is that uh, anything is worthy of our contemplation, okay? So the two became friends. In 1953, Rauschenberg asked John Cage to drive his old Ford, this is John Cage in his Model A, his old Model A Ford, in a straight line over uh, 20 sheets of paper that Rauschenberg had glued together and laid out on the road outside his studio in New York. He poured a pool of paint in the street and the car drove through it onto the paper. The result was a continuous tread print that stretched in a line along the 22-foot length of paper. And this is it. This is uh, Robert Rauschenberg's automobile tire print from 1953. Now, like his hero, Marcel Duchamp, Rauschenberg was exploring the notion with the tire print, with his white paintings, the notion of the artist as a creator of ideas instead of objects. And he was making works, particularly from 1951 to 53, that questioned the limits and the nature of art. He decided to try to discover whether an artwork could be created by removing marks rather than adding them. He needed something to erase. At first, he experimented with erasing his own drawings, but as a young artist without much of a reputation, this just didn't seem right. He had tremendous respect for Wilhelm de Kooning. He decided to ask the prominent abstract expressionist for a drawing to erase. De Kooning agreed. He was reluctant at first, um, but once Rauschenberg 
explain the idea, got him to sit down and listen. He, he did eventually agree. And he decided to donate a drawing that he liked. He said, well, if you're going to do this, it's got to be one that, I, one that I'm going to miss, right? He also didn't want to make it easy for the young Rauschenberg, and he made sure that the drawing included charcoal, pencil, oil paint, and crayon. Uh, now, Rauschenberg later said that it had taken him weeks and many erasers of different types to complete the work. And here it is. This is the erased de Kooning drawing from 1953. It's only one step, one step away from those white paintings. Um, now, Rauschenberg's friend, Jasper Johns, helped Rauschenberg create the label, a mat, and a frame for the work. And Johns was the one who inscribed the label down here, uh, erased de Kooning drawing Robert Rauschenberg, 1953. And this is Jasper Johns. Okay, now uh, it must have taken a long time to erase the drawing uh, because the story is that, uh, or the, the, the piece is dated 1953. Maybe it sat around for a while before Rauschenberg decided to frame it uh, because Jasper Johns didn't complete his military service and moved to New York until 1954. Okay, now the two artists lived and worked in the same building and they became friends. The art dealer Leo Castelli opened his gallery in 1957 with an exhibition of paintings by Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg. A prominent New York art magazine reviewed the show and referred to John's flag from 1955, we looked at that earlier, as well as his targets and his numbers as Neodata. Now, Johns had no idea what the critic meant by Neodata. Okay, he was a few years younger than Rauschenberg, and as I said, he was new to the art scene. Okay, but Rauschenberg, who was familiar with Marcel Duchamp and the Dada movement, offered to borrow a car and drive with him to Philadelphia to see the Philadelphia Museum's Duchamp galleries and to learn about one of the key figures of Dada, to learn about Duchamp. And this is, uh, this is Jasper John's target with plaster casts from that period. Uh, it's a target painting like the green target that we looked at last time, so a very simple, flat, direct painting. Uh, you can shoot at it, just like the flag is a real flag. This is a real target. If you wanted to, you could draw your bow and shoot an arrow into the center of it. It would work just like a regular target. It's also an image of a target, okay? And on this one, there's doors at the top, and sometimes the doors are closed. You can open them one at a time, and they reveal these cast body parts. Uh, Jasper Johns had cast these in plaster and then painted them and he installed them in each of these little windows at the top of the painting. So they got in the car and they drove to Philadelphia to learn about Duchamp. Now the galleries in the Philadelphia Museum have been installed by Duchamp himself in 1954. So this is still here. You can go to Philadelphia today and you can see this complete collection of uh, Marcel Duchamp's work uh, in the museum. Um, and it's essentially the same exhibition that they saw when they went there in 1954. They saw the large glass, the nude descending the staircase, as well as a complete collection of his ready-mades, including fountain and in advance of a broken arm. Now, after the visit, the pair became friends with Marcel. He visited their studio in 1959, um, where he would have seen Jasper's number paintings, his flag, his target paintings, as well as Robert Rauschenberg's combines. I believe at this point... Um, they were on different floors. Uh, Jasper Johns was on one floor and Rauschenberg's studio was on the floor above him. This is called Three Flags. It's similar to the, uh, to the uh, flag, the original flag painting that we saw. This one's at the, Mu the Whitney Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And it's three actual canvases um, uh, attached to one another. So a small, medium, and large canvas. Uh, this one painted in oil, I believe, uh, whereas the other one was painted using wax. Okay. Um, now, getting to know Duchamp, he came, he visited their studio. It was a big deal. It, 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 uh, getting to know him personally had a profound impact on their work. Um, the two of them would continue to explore Duchamp's ideas in paintings and combines and sculptures for the rest of their long and influential careers. Uh, Jasper Johns is still alive. He's in his 80s. He's still producing paintings. Rauschenberg died mm, 15 years ago, I think. This is Ale Cans by Jasper Johns. Um, this was made, this is a great story, actually. Again, Johns was a young artist. He was younger than Robert Rauschenberg. That first exhibition that they had at Leo Castelli's gallery, Johns 
he sold all of Jasper John's paintings, uh, and it caused a sensation, and the Museum of Modern Art actually bought two paintings, including Green Target. Um, so the older artists were a little bit frustrated by this, okay? Uh, Ale Cans was made after Jasper John's heard, uh, he was told, that a very cranky Willem de Kooning had remarked that John's dealer, Leo Castelli, was so skilled he could sell two beer cans. In other words, he's talking about Jasper John's work and saying, ah, he can sell anything, right? If he can sell that stuff. So John's made this sculpture, a uh, simple uh, bronze sculpture, carefully painted of two, uh, two beer cans, and Leo Castelli sold it immediately. So looking at Neodata, Neodata, this is what the, this particular art critic referred to uh, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg's painting as, okay? Uh, the art movement Neodata, even now, primarily refers to Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. There were a few peripheral figures. Um, there was Jim Dine, a, a few other people. Alan Capro, uh, 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 Alan Capro's influential happenings, okay? Uh, were a big part of the neo-data scene at the time. Uh, they were a precursor to what we would now call performance art. Um, they were significant contributions. They were called happenings. The main thrust of the movement, neo-data, was the Duchamp-inspired idea that art could be anything at all, including movement, sound, even smells. Okay, Capro, echoing John Cage, the composer, said, the everyday world is the most astonishing thing conceivable. A walk down 14th Street is more amazing than any masterpiece in art. Okay, so he's talking about contemplation. This is similar to Rauschenberg's assertion that art should reflect the jumble of media and excess that permeates everyday life. When Rauschenberg said that, he was talking about his combines with their, their you know, the, with the objects in them. Uh, just being just being there in in combination and the meaning of them being left up to the viewer. Okay, again, very similar to uh, to John Cage's silent composition, where the music itself is just whatever happens to appear in the environment. Their use of mass media and found objects, uh, and their emphasis on looking beyond traditional art strategies, encouraging their audience to interpret meaning through critical thinking. This would have a profound influence on the art movements that emerged next. Like pop art. Uh, again, this is the 1960s. Okay, Pop artists drew their inspiration from Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg's revolt against the abstract expressionists and traditional views about what art should be. Pop art marked a move away from abstraction and towards an embrace of consumer and media culture as subject matter. This is Roy Lichtenstein's Wham! from 1963. This is another Roy Lichtenstein. This is Oh Jeff, I Love You Too, but from 1964. Lichtenstein's work was influenced by the low art style of comic books and advertising media. Um, this is a painting, an oil painting, and uh, I think this one's about four foot square. Uh, it's close to that anyway. Um, and every one of these little dots is hand painted. Okay, so these are like the Bende dots that you would see in newspaper printing or in comic books at the time. And the fact that he, he took these images and made small modifications to them, but basically just copied them from comic books uh, carefully, dot by dot. Uh, that was the important feature of these paintings. This is a Klaus Oldenburg sculpture, again, pop art. Um, it's called Florberger from 1962. Oldenburg made these soft sculptures like this during the 1960s. Soft because they're made from stuffed canvases, basically. Just canvas painted, canvas stuffed and painted. Um, he said this about these sculptures. Because my work is naturally non-meaningful, it's just echoing, again, the environment that he finds himself in, this consumer environment. Um, because my work is naturally non-meaningful, the meaning found in it will remain doubtful and inconsistent, which is the way it should be. And he also said, all that I care about is that like anything, like, or like any startling piece of nature, like nature, it should be capable of stimulating meaning. So he's saying it doesn't have meaning, but it needs to be capable of stimulating meaning. 
This is Andy Warhol. Um, this one is uh, is called Marilyn Monroe from uh, 1967. It's a painting of the famous actress. Um, and Warhol used silkscreen printing. Um, he uh, he made the paintings using screens, uh, and what was at the time not not really an, 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 uh, a, a typical method of uh, it wasn't a fine art printing method. It was very much a pop culture. Uh, uh, advertising uh, printing method. Um, so he used this method to uh, to create paintings that explore the relationships between fine art, uh, celebrity culture, and advertising. Uh, the silk screens also allowed for repetition. He could use the same screen to produce multiples of the same painting. And here we have uh, Andy Warhol's Campbell's soup cans multiples of the same painting the same way in you know in a grocery store on a shelf you would essentially see multiples of the same manufactured objects like the Campbell soup depicted in these paintings the only difference between them would be the actual flavor of soup on the label of each one other than that they're all pretty much identical um, this is from 1962 now, minimalism um, now, in a broad sense, minimal art can be traced back to, to Malevich. Uh, remember Malevich's Black Square of 1915. It was, it was about reducing painting to its essentials, okay? And the work of Piet Mondrian, again, reductivist, very reductivist paintings, um, uh, exploring uh, you know, how, much, how much can you take out and still have, uh, still have uh, essentially a painting. Um, Mondrian uh, painted, uh, remember the black lines, uh, vertical and horizontal black lines with, uh, with uh, primary colors, uh, color reduced to its, uh, to it, to its very basics uh, in the red, yellow, and blue squares and rectangles in those paintings. Now, more focused minimalism, uh, based on embracing the literal, and a rejection of the pictorial, illusionistic, and narrative nature of traditional art emerged in America in the 1960s. So again, all of these art movements are a reaction against what is uh, the most mainstream art movement uh, of the time, which was abstract expressionism. Now, the minimalists preferred the, uh, the techniques of manufacturing and industrial materials over traditional art materials and processes. They did not believe that art should be expressive of the personal ideas or feelings of the artist and that it should present ordinary subject matter in a literal way. This is Donald Judd's Untitled. It's a stack. He made a number of these stack pieces. This is from 1967. I don't think... They may be painted. Uh, often they were painted. This looks like it might just be a natural patina on the metal. Regardless, it's, uh, it's very slick and industrial produced materials arranged you know, to, to produce a wall sculpture. This is Frank Stella. Frank Stella is probably the most important painter of the minimalist art movement. Um, Frank Stella was a student at Princeton when he saw Jasper John's 1958 solo exhibition at the Leo Castelli Gallery. So he was inspired by Jasper John's use of pre-existing forms, the flags, the targets, the numbers, um, which allowed him to forego invention. He said he, he was freed up. He was using things the mind already knows so that he could focus on, on, on the painting, on the actual process of painting. He didn't have to invent anything um, because the, the forms were already familiar. So he could focus more directly on the physicality of the painted surface. He, you know, Stella set out to make paintings that employed the simplicity of the stripes in the flag painting from 1955 and to push uh, the ideas in Jasper John's paintings even farther. You know, like other minimalist artists, his goal was to make paintings in which the pictorial significance came from the literal physicality of the materials instead of symbolic meaning. Uh, he famously stated, what you see is what you see. Uh, there's, there's canvas, uh, there's painted stripes, um, there's nothing else. Think about that. And this is The Marriage of Reason and Squalor, two from 1959. When I say stripes, these are often called pinstripe paintings, but the stripes are the actual black lines. You can see him working on it in his studio. These are the stripes. The, uh, the, the pinstripes or the white areas between the stripes are just the raw canvas peeking through. So there's nothing there. 
what you see is what you see simply paint on canvas and the shape of the canvas uh, determines the uh, the pattern of the uh, of the stripes the stripe formations we have conceptual art now um, also in the 1960s these these movements all basically emerged at the same time uh, and extended into the 1970s now the artist Saul LeWitt he was the first to define conceptual art in an article that he wrote in 1967 he wrote in conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. The conceptual artists emphasize the importance of the idea over any physical product or object. Now, Solowitz's wall drawings, they're made up of lines drawn directly on the gallery wall. He left instructions with these works so that he, would, he wouldn't have to be present for the drawing to re be reproduced in the future. This is, you know, just, just like, just like uh, 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 Robert Rauschenberg, allowing that anybody else could produce his white paintings uh, if they were needed for a future ex uh, exhibition. Um, once this exhibition was over, the gallery wall could be repainted, but the work would still exist, and it could be remade thanks to the set of instructions that he left behind. And it could be remade by anyone. That was the point. The, the work of art was an idea. It was not an object. This is wall drawing uh, number 273. This was from 1975. Joseph Kosuth. Uh, since the 1960s, Joseph Kosuth had made, or he has made work, and I think, believe he's still alive, has made work that, uh, that explores the role of language and meaning within art. Now, his early work consisted of an object, a photograph of the same object, and a dictionary definition of the object. And he said in 1969 that the value of particular artists, any artist after Duchamp, their value can be weighed according to how much they question the nature of art. So that's central to, to all of these projects, actually, is, uh, is the idea that, uh, that we shouldn't take for granted what art is. We have to explore uh, what it can be. Okay, um, this is called One and Three Shovels, and naturally it's a nod to Marcel Duchamp and his In Advance of a Broken Arm. It's a different shovel, though. This is Joseph Kosu's uh, shovel. Uh, this is the actual shovel. This is a photograph of the shovel, and this is a dictionary definition of shovel. So all three different ways of considering a shovel. Okay. Uh, that's enough. That'll do it for uh, for ideas and the influence of ideas on modern painting. Um, I'll see you guys next time. Okay, take care.